Well, since 1925, Kenya has been on a quest to become a newly industrialized nation with the formation of the East African Colonial Commission, which was a push to try and bring more investors into the Kenya's agriculture sector. This is becoming a reality even as the country gears towards the achievement of Vision 2030. This week on Inside Government, we are talking to Cabinet Secretary for Industrialization, Trade and Enterprise Development, Betty Minor. Even as Kenya engages in commercial diplomacy to try and boost foreign direct investment into the country. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Madam C.S. for joining us this week. Thank you very much for having me. Very good. I mean, the, the world is now migrating from uh, what has always been referred to as political diplomacy and now getting into another era of uh, commercial diplomacy whereby you try to assert your, you, you, you know, yourself through uh, the means of in, interacting and uh, engaging more investors into your country. Uh, have we embraced this concept, concept yet? Thank you very much. I think we actually have. I think with the realization and with the end of the Cold War, uh, nations have found other reasons and other reasons for contest with each other. And uh, economic progress has become a critical one, and that's actually the current uh, theater of uh, contests uh, for global supremacy. And therefore, it's important that countries seek to advance their co economic interests and the role of our foreign uh, relations is really uh, around advancing commercial interests. So in, ad in, in addition to matters of uh, political diplomacy, it's also important to note that that must uh, meet the goals and aspirations of a nation's uh, commercial and uh, economic interests. Therefore, the term economic diplomacy. When you look at the country's um, uh, foreign uh, 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 policy, we, we talk about, you know, first of all, you know, deepening our trade ties with our regional peers, and I'm talking about Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda. You, you realize that uh, we are somehow softening. Uh, what are we doing to ensure that uh, we, we regain our foothold in the region? Actually, I mean, I think uh, the, mis the interpretation of that data uh, is, is, in my view, the conclusion you make is actually quite, quite wrong. Kenya has been a core pillar of uh, regional, uh, regional development. It's a driver of the East African community. And one of the first instruments uh, of the re-energized community was the establishment of the Customs Union. And the Customs Union was principally um, a tool for industrialization uh, within the region. So what you actually see in uh, East Africa right now is that the other countries have invested in their industrial capacity and some of the goods that they used to import from Kenya, they produce for themselves, just like the things we produce for ourselves, um, we don't import. And the message that comes uh, from that, your neighbors are always your first market but beyond that, once your neighbors also develop, it's important to look further afield. And that is the reason why Kenya has invested in external um, <clears throat> uh, no, uh, trade relations outside uh, East Africa, like in the context of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, or COMESA, or even further afield to other continents. So these numbers, Kenya's exports have been increasing over time, but we see we're also trying to diversify our market beyond the region because the region is becoming more self-sufficient in a lot of the goods that Kenya produces. Well, it's quite true that uh, you know, our regional peers, I mean, they have also expanded the in industrial base. Uh, and and that's, um, that has somehow you know, cut their reliance on Kenyan's uh, uh, imports. But at the same time, one would also expect that, you know, as they expand their industrial base, Kenya would also be expanding its industrial base in a bid to capture you know, that market in a different way. But Kenya has. When we look at the numbers uh, from the economic survey and other numbers, our industrial output has actually been increasing year on year for the past, I mean, actually a little from whenever we've kept our statistics. The portion of manufacturing under GDP is not as high compared to other sectors, but the quantum of industrial output is actually higher each year. Uh, and, that's, and those are the numbers 
that we have. And that is very evident when you walk into retail outlets like supermarkets and stuff like that, you will actually see more value-added products that are origin, uh, origin uh, Kenya that you didn't see uh, before. Uh, you, can, you, know, you can fill your cart with only made in Kenya products, whether it is soap, whether it is coffee, whether it is milk, whether it is confectionaries, or even apparel. So our output and the sophistication of our product has actually been increasing year on year. But when you look at um, you know, even trade statistics, um, you realize that um, you know, Kenya's exports to the EAC region you know, in the year 2020, well, one might argue because of um, you know, supply chain, chain, chain disruptions because of COVID, whereby you had a dip of about a 6 to 7% in 2020. Uh, is, is it proper to say that uh, uh, we, we, we still hold strong to the East African market. It's a critical market. You can never wish away your region, even if uh, they are outgrowing some products. I think the message to Kenya and the message to Kenyan industrialists is to begin to invest in other products that they haven't yet been replaced in that uh, in the regional market. But the, our traditional, uh, you know, low-value products, perhaps. Things, I mean, one of some of the things that in the beginning of 2005 with the customs union we used to export into the region is something like, you know, cooking oil. But the same Kenyan investors have invested in those countries and therefore there's really no need for us to keep sending cooking oil to Uganda when it is already being produced there. So those numbers, I mean, it means that we, nef we therefore have to replace those numbers with other products. Mm -hmm. But in reality, I mean, when we, when we still, when we look at it, and I think that's the motivation that gives Kenya the reason to look for further markets afield, because you won't always rely on your neighbors. They've developed their industrial capacity. You know, if I can take you back to the year 2014, and I had an interview with you uh, as um, when you used to be at uh, the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, and one of the concerns that you raised was that uh, you know, because of high production costs, uh, you know, Kenya was losing its uh, competitive edge in the regional markets to new uh, um, uh, players like South Africa, like Egypt. And uh, just two weeks ago, the Kenya Association of Manufacturers actually raised the same concerns. They say that uh, because of a uh, harsh, what they called harsh taxation regime and um, you know, the cost of production in this country, we, we, we are losing our competitive edge in the region. Uh, do you still hold to that thought? No, I think the cost of production in Kenya is a concern, uh, not just for business, but also for government, because we also take in those numbers. We know our relative costs, whether it's electricity, whether it is transport, whether it is regulation. And the duty uh, of government is to begin is to address those, um, those, binding, uh, those binding constraints. Some of the investment, for instance, in infrastructure has made a difference when it comes to uh, logistics and the costs and the cost of logistics, some of the investment in IT, for instance, is really uh, eliminating and uh, smoothening regulatory uh, regulatory challenges. So we are alive to that. I mean, uh, the private sector talks to us a lot and we're able to understand and highlight the areas of uh, burdensome, uh, burdensome regulations and burdensome. Uh, impact of some of the requirements uh, of government. I think taxation is, a, is an interesting one because the formal sector clearly is one of our greatest sources of, uh, of, 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 of revenue. But we live in a situation where citizens want services from government, but they don't want to pay the taxes that will fuel, you know, finance those services, of services. So there's a great demand for social services. With, there's a great demand for education, for health, for infrastructure, and it has to come from somewhere. And the only, uh, for a country such as Kenya, which we do, doesn't have minerals, we're going to have to rely on uh, revenue raised through taxation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how, how is this likely to impact um, our industrialization uh, agenda in, um, as we even move closer to the year 2030? I think we'll be proud of ourselves as Kenyan if we can finance our own. Uh, development and industrial development and therefore uh, looking to still the Kenyan private sector to invest 
in, uh, in, in industries uh, right here. One of the mo uh, moves that Ken uh, the government has, uh, has, you know, has, uh, has undertaken is to ensure that there is a market for Kenyan-made goods. Uh, we call it Buy Kenya, Build Kenya, but within government last year, for instance, we issued a master role on preferential procurement that targets and uh, um, safeguards some element of government procurement to local products to ensure that they have a market. When you look at um, you know, the manufacturing base in this country, I mean, and its contribution to GDP, and this is a subject that has always been um, discussed in many fora, uh, that uh, we need to jumpstart our, our, our manufacturing base, you know, from and its contribution to GDP from about 19% to around 15% by the year 2025. But uh, now it appears to be uncertain that we can actually achieve this, this target. Do, do you agree with this? We need to watch two numbers. Um, and the number of uh, the percentage of manufacturing to GDP would assume that other sectors are contracting, and they're not. Uh, one of our fastest growing sector is services. You know, with the level of education that we have, with uh, our location, uh, for instance, with other global connections, the services sector will always grow quite rapidly. The ease of entry into it. Uh, agriculture uh, sector has been our mainstay, and we've actually seen uh, a great expansion in agricultural investments. So we need to look at manufacturing in the context uh, of manufacturing itself. And this is the numbers that I've given you that year on year, we're actually seeing nearly you know, between five and 10% expansion in output year on year. We're seeing more sophisticated uh, products uh, coming in. We're seeing more value addition, whether it is traditional products like tea, like coffee, like honey, but also a greater variety, for instance, in our textile sector. So those are the numbers. The output numbers in manufacturing are the numbers. But, but it's also very important to also look at, um, you know, the industrial base and to see, you know, whether it is expanding. Because uh, there's beauty when the two numbers, you know, are expanding at the same rate, whereby industrialization is expanding as well as output, industrial output. But, but 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 this is not the case. But I think you're 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 over focusing on the proportion of the national product that manufacturing uh, contributes. I have said that unless you want another sector to shrink, because that's what it would mean. You know, for percentages to change, then services would have to shrink. But why should services shrink when it is a great one of the greatest employers, especially of our young people? Why should agriculture shrink? Because it is, I mean, and actually a lot of our manufacturing output expansion is because of the relationship and value uh, addition to our agricultural, agricultural product. So I think the, the, the number that we really need to keep watching is to see if there is additional investment in the country in this sector. And the numbers confirm that to see whether there is additional um, um, modernization and changes in the product. So we keep focusing. We obviously would like to see manufacturing uh, grow to the 15% because that is our ambition and that is our stated goal. But at the same time, as we wait for that, it's important to ensure that there is actually expansion of, of whatever of manufacturing product in the country. What do we need to do at this point to ensure that um, you know, we get to our long-term aspiration of about a 20% contribution of GDP to, uh, I mean, 20% contribution to our GDP by the year 2030? We'll need to come in. What, one of the things that we focused on uh, as a ministry is identifying uh, products that can drive this industrial uh, agenda both drawn from uh, raw materials that are available uh, within the country or others that are not. Uh, like, for instance, we've, not, we, we, we've chosen to focus on textiles and apparel. But right now, a lot of our inputs is still imported. Therefore, it's important to uh, produce and uh, focus on the entire, uh, entire value chain. Other things that we're doing is uh, uh, the proposed uh, no, sub, uh, provision of industrial infrastructure like the export processing zones or the special economic zones as areas which can 
you can locate, um, you can locate uh, more producers. But thirdly, we're also focusing on expanding our markets for Kenya with the trade agreements that we have reached, with, whether it's in East Africa, or sorry, in Africa itself, or even as we negotiate further afield. Because those sort of signals, uh, they send signals to investors, and that would help us boost our output. And, uh, you know, when you look at um, the, the Kenya transformation, the Kenya industrial transformation agenda, we, we talk about uh, as uh, industrial bases in other places, you know, like Naivasha and, and, and so much. But, but, but on the ground, uh, you know, almost six years down the line, we, we, we are yet to see any investment in the, in the SCZs, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the special economic zones. Uh, where are we on this? It's taken us a while. I think one of the first things that we needed to do was acquire, uh, acquire new land. I mean, for the EPZ, we've actually had expansion uh, of zones and gazettement of more zones, some private, uh, some, uh, some uh, within government. For the special economic zones, we actually have active special economic zones uh, that are gazetted. Some are private, like Tatu, like, uh, like the one in Eldred, but some are government, like the one in Ivasha. And one of the things I'm really excited about is in this very short period, we've managed to acquire land. We've managed to put in an ICD at uh, Naivasha. We're now putting in the infrastructure and starting uh, to construct uh, the horizontal infrastructure. And the private sector is then invited to come and develop the vertical infrastructure. So there is a, a partnership between government and the private sector to bring this policy into fruition. Part of this was also to come up with an, uh, a leather city uh, uh, in, in Machakos, um, as well as establishing um, a fledgling um, SEZ uh, in uh, Dongokundu. But, but, but this has not happened. Where are we stuck? I think the, the leather city is currently under construction. Uh, one of the um, pillar or let's say cornerstone investments has been the effluent uh, treatment plant, and that is now. Uh, nearly completion, and I'm, and I'm aware that even the construction of just some of the basic uh, administrative facilities has commenced. And Dongokundu, one of the things that has commenced is the construction of the Dongokundu Bypass Road, which would be the entry point into uh, the industrial park. Uh, the Ministry of Energy has also supplied uh, electricity, and in order then to have the physical development, one of the things that we're working on is on uh, ensuring that the land is available for the developer and uh, um, you know, free of any encumbrance and any settlement. So we've, we've made some, you know, you don't do these things overnight, but this is, uh, the, if you actually go to the ground, you will find some activity. Do we have any investors who are... Um uh, have shown interest in setting up um, the industrial bases in, uh, in our uh, special economic zones? Oh yes, we have actually fielded and received interest from quite a few investors and one, one, in fact one of the things that uh, pushes us is the fact that we don't have the spaces ready for the investors but in terms of the lineup we have received interest and all that we can uh, we, we, we need to work hard to ensure that these are delivered expeditiously, otherwise they could lose, easily lose interest and find another location. So there is interest in Kenya, but we need to secure it quickly. And, and the other thing that um, you know, uh, the private sector has raised, uh, the other concern is uh, the issue of counterfeit. And I know uh, you also, um, you are at the forefront during your stint at KAM, you're in trying to fight and bring about uh, the issues of, uh, around counterfeit. Uh, are we losing the war to counterfeit? I wouldn't say we're losing the war, but we require both uh, government agencies and also consumers to become, uh, consumers need to be uh, much better attuned at demanding genuine products because the fix have a market because we prefer to buy something cheap. And sometimes if that is uh, as a result of theft of intellectual property, then you're, we're actually stunting our, our, our industrial base. So it's critical that consumers invest in genuine, uh, in genuine products. 
But otherwise, I mean, working with the anti, through the anti counterfeit agency and in a multi agency approach uh, with the Bureau of Standards and the Revenue Authority, we continue to enforce uh, the standards on uh, respect for intellectual property. Is it true when um, the private sector says that, um, you know, seven out of ten products sold in the Kenyan market, you know, are fake products? Well, I think they have to share the statistics because. Um, in some, in, you know, in, in, I think in some uh, settlements and in some uh, locations, it's we've we've they, we've actually been able to track that and seen you know a large number of uh, um, you know uh, either substandard products or fake products, which is why uh, organisations like the ACA, uh, the Bureau of Standards, through their market surveillance activities, are able uh, to pick uh, to pick this out. And uh, the other, the other being, being uh, you know, there was a time um, the government from a multi-agency team, you know, made up of various players in the sector to try and deal with this. Uh, have we seen any result of this? I think the multi-agency action uh, uh, work uh, in 20, uh, 2018 and 2019 have actually been very effective and a good deterrent against uh, the proliferation of these uh, uh, fake and substandard products because that, that concerted approach sent the message that the, the Kenya government wanted to enforce uh, standards and wanted to enforce intellectual uh, property. But having said that, this continues to be the mainstay of activities such as the ACA, and the Bureau of Standards and the Revenue Authority. And those mandates did not cease with the cessation of the rapid action by the multi-agency team. The multi-agency team was a concerted RRI. But the raison data for these institutions is to ensure that the products in the market have uh, the due revenue has been collected, that intellectual property rights are respected, and thirdly, that the necessary standards are upheld. And the question of um, uh, um, energy, you know, uh, and this is something that, uh, you know, the private sector has also picked up, um, that um, in as much as, you know, the quality of power or energy has improved in this country, uh, there is something that we need to do about uh, cost. And, um, but we have also seen, you know, government, you know, moving up to try and suppress the cost of uh, energy in this country. But uh, is, is there much that can be done? I'd like more, you know, we don't like more to be done. I'm certain that you and I would like to be able to walk home, switch on the lights and pay nothing. It would be, yeah, that, that's, I mean, uh, which, of course cannot <laughs> which cannot happen. So we need to recognize that these investments uh, require, you know, require, require resources. And what we need to keep working on is ensuring that the least cost and least, yeah, least cost power development plan is upheld and that we you know, address the costs uh, in the sector, uh, you know, as a, with, with such scrutiny to ensure that you pass on to consumer the bare minimum. Because we are competing with countries that sell their power cheaper than uh, our industrialists buy it. And, and if power is a significant part of the production base, then yes, that affects our competitiveness a lot. So I'm glad, and I'm glad that you also acknowledge and the industry acknowledges that we have addressed the issues of stability, we have addressed the issues of, uh, of quality, and you know, uh, as we make progress, we, like, we are addressing the issues of costs as well. <laughs> <laughs> Which of course cannot happen. The Kenyan labor force is extremely uh, capable, is extremely well uh, qualified. Uh, the Kenyan regime, I understand, and I, and I, and, and I appreciate that, yes. Uh, some of our labor costs are considered higher than uh, the neighbors, but the productivity of Kenyans is also uh, much higher than some of our, you know, our counterparts uh, in, in, in the region. And the more we incentivize productivity-based pay, I would actually expect that we'll see greater in, you know, and greater competitiveness from the Kenyan labor force. In terms of uh, human resource, I mean, um it is, it is often said that, uh, you know, Kenya has one of the best human resources um, uh, in, in, in Africa, but um, it is costly. Is there anything that can be done to try and work around, you know, number one, the productivity on av of an average Kenyan, and as well as um, work on a formula 
uh, whereby you know wages and uh, production cost uh, for for an ordinary Kenya is 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 addressed. We will continue to focus on SMEs. They are the nerve center of any uh, entrepreneurial development in any country. More than 90% of all businesses globally are SMEs. So the Kenya government cannot forget its SMEs. We obviously wish we would do more, but whatever we've done, whether with the credit guarantee, whether with provision of um, market opportunities, provision of infrastructure, uh, through things like the CIDCs or through KIEs. Uh, I appreciate that even our banking sector all have uh, SME, uh, you know, SME focused businesses because that's the largest part uh, of the business. So we will continue to support our SMEs with our policies and with programs of government. And we urge and ask our you know, colleagues in the private sector, most of them SMEs as well, to support the rest of the ecosystem. The SME sector is um, definitely the heartbeat of, uh, of uh, 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 job creation in this, in this, in this country. And uh, of course, there are so many interventions you know, that have been put in place to try and boost uh, the growth of SMEs in this country. What should we expect uh, uh, going forward in a bit to empower SMEs? Industrialization, there's really no, uh, we can't walk away from the journey of industrialization in Kenya. Whatever challenges we have faced, whatever environment that we find ourselves in, it is a worthy uh, focus and goal, not just of now, not just of government, but for also uh, the rest of the private sector uh, to invest in. So as, as far as I can, you know, I, I, I can tell and I can say, this is the journey that we must walk as a country uh, as well, uh, you know, for, for, our, you know, for, for our own good and for our own development. And from where you sit or you stand, I mean, when you do a SWOT analysis of Kenya's um, industrialization agenda, what would you see as the challenges or threats and opportunities? No, thank you very much for giving me time to speak. And um, I'm sure there's a lot that we didn't get to talk about and we're happy to talk about it again another time. Well, we have been discussing issues around uh, uh, commercial diplomacy as well as uh, Kenya's uh, industrialization agenda with uh, industrialization, uh, trade and enterprise development uh, uh, cabinet secretary Betty Miner. And of course, we have heard it from her that Kenya's quest to become a, an industrialized nation is unstoppable going forward. Thank you for your time. This has been Inside Government.